Good morning and welcome. Globalization has produced enormous and widespread benefits as well as troublesome economic imbalances. Economic freedom and transformative technologies have accelerated the pace of change and challenged the, abilities of the ability of governments to keep up. Understanding the economic, political, and institutional challenges of this new era is crucial to developing and coordinating effective policies to meet them. Today, Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, affectionately known as SIPA, is formally launching its new Center on Global Economic Governance. The Center plans to bring together academic economists, social scientists, policymakers, business leaders, and other experts to discuss criti the critical issues facing the global economy. The Center will foster new research by leading academic specialists, leading practitioners, convene discussions among key thought leaders from every sector, and follow up with targeted meetings and publications designed to influence both policy decisions and the institutions that make them. The university welcomes this new and important center. SIPA, as you know, is already the most global of Columbia's professional schools. It already plays a key role in ne nearly every one of the university's global initiatives, including our global centers spread out across the world, two of which are directed by SIPA graduates. <clears throat> as SIPA's former dean, I can report that the school began working toward the creation <clears throat> of this new Center on Global Economic Governance in 2008-9. The global financial crisis and the efforts to cope both with it and the ensuing steep recession made us all painfully and urgently aware of how much we still had to learn about managing the global economy. It is thus a special pleasure for me to welcome you all to the Center's inauguration and to introduce to you the Center's founding director, Professor Jan Svenner. SIPA recruit, recruited Jan from the University of Michigan, where he served as the director of the International Policy Center at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. He had also served as director of the Davidson Institute of Michigan's Ross School of Business. Jan was educated in the Czech Republic and Cornell University before completing his PhD in economics at Princeton. He is the author and editor of too many books to name and dozens of articles on the impact of government policies on firms, labor, and capital markets, especially in transitional and less developed economies. His work on corporate and national governance issues and on entrepreneurships, entrepreneurship in these settings is also widely cited and admired. From 1992 to 1997, he served as the founding director of the Economics Institute of the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic. He has also served as co-director of the transition program at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London, president of the Association for Comparative Economic Studies, president of the International Association for the Economics of Labor Management, associate editor of the Journal of Economic Perspectives, and a governing board member of the European Economic Association, as well as advisor to numerous policymakers, institutions, and firms. Please join me in welcoming Jan Svenner to Colombia, to SIPA, and to the directorship of SIPA's new Center on Global Economic Governance. Thank you, thank you very much, John. Welcome, everyone, to the uh, launch of the center. I should mention that uh, what has become obvious, John is obviously behind the creation of this center, both in terms of ideas and in terms of the implementation. And it's really an extreme pleasure uh, to welcome you today to the uh, launch of the Center on Global Economic Governance. We view the center as a unique opportunity to provide stimulating environment for Colombia's faculty, students, an opportunity to bring in leading academics, policymakers, and business leaders from all over the world and participate in the creation and dissemination of hopefully pioneering ideas dealing with the issues of global economic governance. Now, what this includes is work related to the uh, current crisis in Europe and its effect on the global economy that we will hear about today. 
the new relevance of emerging markets and the role they'll play in the global architecture. Uh, we uh, envision working on issues relating to trade, labor, regulation, sustainable growth. In other words, uh, issues that we are grappling with today as much as in any time in history. Uh, we envision uh, CGEG, as we endearingly call the center, as producing a new wave of uh, policy-oriented research on these global issues, stressing excellence, recognition, visibility, and impact. Um, we're looking forward to working with you and others, and we welcome you to uh, discuss with us and participate in the creation of new ideas and posing questions facing the global economy. Now, I'm extremely pleased to have with us today Alan Kruger as the keynote speaker and to welcome him to Colombia to give a major address on jobs deficit in the United States and around the world. As you know, Alan Kruger is the chairman of President Barack Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. He uh, is also a member of the cabinet of the president. He previously served in the Obama administration as assistant secretary for uh, economic policy and chief economist at the US Department of the Treasury. He is currently on leave from uh, Princeton University where he is the Bendheim Professor of Economics and Public Affairs. He has held a joint appointment in the Economics Department and in the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton since 1987. He's had numerous other appointments, including in 1994-95, where he served as the Chief Economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. Now, Alan and I have a number of things in common. The first one is we both receive our bachelor's degrees from the same uh, school, namely the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at uh, Cornell University. Alan then received his MA and PhD at Harvard University. Um, in most respects, when you look at his academic achievement uh, and recognition, he is undoubtedly one of the most accomplished uh, economists of today. He, uh, in terms of the orientation of the work, of his work and appeal, he is also one of the most exciting economists to actually listen to, read his work, and work with him. Now, uh, I think he also has another uh, important uh, characteristic. Uh, I would say he is the most persevering in the face of adversity economist. And the reason I say that is that many years ago, when I was teaching my first class after graduating uh, from Princeton with my PhD, he was sitting in the introductory class at Cornell where I was for the first time trying to teach. And uh, it was undoubtedly a very trying experience for the students in class. Alan is the one who survived the class, aced it, was on top of the class, and went on to become an economist. So uh, I think he deserves the medal for perseverance in the face of adversity. So let me welcome Alan Kruger. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Uh, after listening to your introduction, I was asking myself, why did I discourage my mother from coming this morning? Uh, Jan mentioned he taught the first course uh, that I took in economics 30 years ago at Cornell. Uh, I hadn't realized it was Jan's first time teaching. Uh, I do remember the book he used. You used Lipsy and Steiner, and you supplemented, supplemented the textbook with Al Reese's book uh, on the economics of work and pay, which is actually close to the subject I'll be talking about today. I uh, thought I'd mention that when I was a student at Cornell, there was a rumor among my classmates uh, that Jan had managed a daring escape from Czechoslovakia when he was in high school, that he became a champion skier and he uh, managed to defect from Czechoslovakia by uh, going to a ski competition in Switzerland and staying there. Uh, then he made his way to the U.S. and finished top, top in his class at Cornell and earned a Ph.D. at Princeton. I later learned that that rumor was completely true. 
Uh, I think not only is that story a testament uh, to Jan's talent and perseverance, it also shows America at its best as the land of opportunity. In fact, when I did some fact-checking a few minutes ago and I asked Jan if he went to Switzerland, he said he came to the United States because he couldn't get into college in Switzerland. Just another example of the opportunity that America has uh, provided. Um, I was really fortunate when I was at Cornell. I had John for microeconomics and I had Mark Gertler who was making a, a, a brief stop at Cornell, uh, eventually on his way to NYU. I had Mark Gertler for macroeconomics. Uh, and from Jan and Mark, I learned that economics is a discipline that can help society solve its most pressing problems. And that's the way I think of this new center, and it's really an honor for me to participate in the inaugural launch uh, of the new Columbia Center on Global Economic Governance. Uh, and when I think back about those classes that I had from Mark and Jan, the lessons I learned are really relevant for today. Uh, I learned that economic downturns caused by financial crises can inflict lasting harm if left to their own devices, and that the appropriate mix of economic policies can reduce the damage and speed recovery. I also learned that companies hire workers because they think it is profitable to do so. And I learned that wages are determined by a mix of factors, including labor supply, labor demand, technology, education and skills, and institutional features that affect bargaining power and employee morale. The topic I will discuss this morning has strands of both microeconomics and macroeconomics, of both Jan's class and Mark's class. In particular, I will address problems in the U.S. labor market and President Obama's blueprint to fix them. My theme is that it will take a concerted national effort to, verse, to reverse the problems that have been building in the job market for decades. And although much work still needs to be done, we have made notable progress in the last few years. The United States has considerable strengths that should help us to reverse the middle class jobs deficit. No country has a more productive workforce better colleges and universities, or more daring and innovative entrepreneurs. It is imperative that policymakers build on these strengths to create an expanding middle class and provide more opportunities for young people regardless of their backgrounds. As President Obama has stressed, this is the this is the defining issue of our times. We face a critical moment in which we can pursue a path that leads to a more durable economy and growing opportunities for all Americans, or we can return to the policies that caused the erosion of the middle class and tilted an ever-increasing share of income into the hands of a fortunate few. When President Obama first walked into the Oval Office, he faced three distinct but related job crises. The first crisis, which is well known, is that the U.S. was mired in a deep recession at the end of 2008. The economy was losing over 700,000 jobs a month when President Obama took the oath of office in January 2009. Although the initial report of GDP growth for the fourth quarter of 2008 was minus 3.8 percent, which itself was the biggest contraction in over 25 years, 
We subsequently learned from revisions that the economy was actually shrinking at an alarming annual rate of 8.9 percent. The job losses even exceeded what one would predict from that steep drop in GDP. So the first and most immediate job crisis that the President faced was the massive loss in jobs due to the financial crisis and deep recession that erupted in 2008. The second crisis began before the Great Recession. And the second jobs crisis that the President faced and the nation faced was that the U.S. was not creating enough jobs even in the previous expansion. The 2000s were on track for the worst decade of job growth in over 50 years. And that's before the steep job loss from the recession that began in 2007. If you look at this chart, uh, if you take out uh, if you take out the recession uh, at the end of the first decade uh, of the 21st century, job growth was below 6 percent. In every previous decade, job growth exceeded 20 percent. The slowing of job growth in the U.S. in the 2000s was not a result of demographic shifts or slower population growth. The 2001 to 2007 recovery was the only completed recovery on record in which the share of the population employed at the end of the recovery in 2007 was below where it was when the recovery began in 2001. So the second jobs crisis is that the economy was not generating enough jobs in the years leading up to the Great Recession. And the third jobs crisis involves inequality, which had been rising in the U.S. since the late 1970s. The rise in inequality initially reflected falling wages of less educated workers. Male high school graduates, for example, saw an 11 percent drop in their wages after adjusting for inflation from 1979 to 1989. The problem of real wage erosion spread to workers with higher education and the middle class. The median real wage, the wage for the worker just in the middle of the distribution, stagnated. And because of polarization in the wage distribution, because we had more people at the top and more at the very bottom, the number of people in the middle class shrank. In this next chart, I use a definition uh, of the middle class. In the next chart, there we go. Uh, this uh, defines the middle class uh, as people who earn 50, uh, within 50 percent of the median earnings. So you take the median salary in the economy and you go up and down 50 percent. Uh, that's one definition that could be used uh, of the broad middle class. Uh, and you can see that the middle class uh, has been shrinking since 1980. Together, these three job crises constitute what I call the middle class jobs deficit. Simply put, for over a decade, the U.S. economy has not been producing enough middle class jobs. The middle class jobs deficit is both cyclical and structural. It is partly cyclical and can be partly addressed by counter cyclical measures because an output gap remains from the recession that began at the end of 2007. And it is partly structural because the forces that caused the middle class jobs deficit began long before the last recession and, in fact, persisted and worsened 
in previous recoveries. In this year's State of the Union address, President Obama laid out a blueprint for an economy built to last. The goal of that blueprint is to create a more durable economy with faster economic growth and faster job growth, and ultimately, a stronger, more secure middle class. A vibrant and expanding middle class is good for America. It's good for our political, economic, and civic institutions. It's good for our workers, and it's also good for our businesses. One of the reasons why consumption has been so weak is that we have tilted so much income in American society to the top wealthiest few who have a lower marginal propensity to consume. A growing middle class is good for our prospects for future economic growth, and it's also good for our national identity. The American economy became the envy of the world because of our strong and inclusive middle class. A major part of my job as chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors is to work with others in the Obama administration to pursue policies to reverse the middle class jobs deficit. While one should not expect problems that have been building for decades to be solved overnight, the record to date provides evidence that progress is being made. And I would add, we can now see a path towards reversing the decades-long slide in middle-class jobs for the first time in a while. Reversing the middle-class jobs deficit requires playing both good defense and good offense. To paraphrase Casey Stengel, good defense beats good offense and vice versa. Both are necessary. Defense means that we as a nation want to hold on to and promote as many existing good jobs as possible. Offense means that we want to create an environment for new companies and new industries to develop and to provide educational and trading opportunities for workers to meet the demands of a modern economy. One can also think of this game plan in terms of time horizons. In early 2009, immediate actions were, were required to stop the steep job losses from the severe recession. Over the longer term, investment in research and education support economic growth and, and an expanding middle class. First and foremost, Reversing the middle class jobs deficit required ending the worst recession since the Great Depression. The economy lost five million jobs in the year before President Obama took office and nearly four million more before his policies were fully in effect. In 2008 and early 2009, the economy was in a, was in a free fall. This chart shows that the bottom fell out of GDP at the end of 2008 as a result of the financial crisis. Thanks in large part to the support for aggregate demand from the Recovery Act and a set of financial rescue measures put in place by the Treasury Department and Federal Reserve, the downward spiral was halted by the middle of 2009. This counts as playing defense. And it was defense that would make even the New York Giants proud. The President's bold actions to rescue and restructure Chrysler and General Motors, and equally importantly, to preserve the auto supply network during the worst of the economic crisis, was another component of playing defense to support middle class jobs. Together, these defensive actions stopped the downward spiral in the economy. Shortly after the Recovery Act took effect, 
the economy stopped shrinking and started expanding. GDP has grown for 10 straight quarters from mid-2009 until the end of last year, and we'll learn about first quarter GDP growth tomorrow. Auto sales, in particular, have rebounded strongly since the crisis. An article last week reported that car companies are worried that a shortage of parts supplies may crimp production. Think how much worse off we would be had the president not made the decision to rescue the parts suppliers. But the damage from the Great Recession was severe, and it worsened the middle-class job deficit that had been accumulating over previous decades. Job growth turned positive about eight months after the Deep Recession officially ended. We have now had 25 months in a row of private sector job growth. Over this period, private businesses have added 4.1 million jobs. While there is a long way to go, this is an important step. Sustaining the recovery is critical for reversing the jobs deficit. The next chart shows that private sector job growth in the ongoing recovery, which is shown by the black line, is about on track with the recovery in the early 1990s, which is shown by the blue line, and significantly stronger than the job growth in the last recovery. New research has found that middle-class jobs are most likely to be lost during times of economic recession. This work provides an important complement to Arthur Oaken's classic finding that workers are more likely to climb job ladders when the economy is strong. A strong economy provides more opportunities for workers who are barely getting by as employers are more willing to offer job training and take a chance on workers who they might otherwise not hire at a time when the economy is not as strong. We saw this in the early 1990s, uh, early and late 1990s, I should say. That was the only period in the last 30 years when all segments of the income distribution grew together. Uh, this chart shows by uh, fifth of the income distribution, income growth uh, from uh, 1979 to 2010 on top, and then the bottom shows the last five years of the 90s. The lesson I take away from this history is that we as a nation should take all responsible measures to sustain and strengthen the ongoing recovery. Continuing and strengthening the recovery helps with all three job crises. President Obama has proposed the American Jobs Act to support the recovery, and important elements have already been put in place. Most importantly, we are continuing the two percentage point payroll tax cut for American workers. The President has also put in place measures to help responsible homeowners to refinance and modify their mortgages to take advantage of historically low interest rates. Other elements of the President's proposal, which continue in the President's latest budget proposal, would provide funding for state and local governments so they can hold on to teachers and first responders and provide for greater investments in America's infrastructure. President Obama has proposed a blueprint for a more durable economy going forward that would be built on American manufacturing, clean and safe domestic energy, research and development, and improved skills for American workers. Other components of the President's economic strategy include the National Export Initiative with the goal of doubling exports by the end of 2014 and support for startup businesses. I want to emphasize that there are complementarities among these policies 
that are critical for reversing the middle class jobs deficit. They reinforce each other. Increasingly, economists have come to appreciate the existence of spillover effects across companies and organizations in local areas that come together to support job growth. There is an important role for economic policy here because individual companies, workers, colleges, and training providers do not take the full benefit they confer on others into account in their decision making. In economic terms, the strategy to reverse the middle class jobs deficit involves leveraging positive, positive externalities to raise labor demand and productivity and create new industries and products while equipping American workers with the tools they need to succeed in a modern economy. The President's blueprint to create an economy that's built to last would promote synergies within local areas and among companies that would add to growth and make it less profitable for companies to pick up and move overseas. In fact, the President's strategy is to draw as many jobs back to America as possible. Let me illustrate this with the manufacturing sector. Expanding middle class jobs in manufacturing, especially advanced manufacturing, is part of the President's comprehensive strategy for reversing the middle class jobs deficit. Manufacturing continues to provide a large number of middle class jobs, especially for workers who have less than a four-year college degree. Uh, this chart shows that 63% of manufacturing workers who have an associate's degree or less earn within 50% of the overall median salary, which was the def definition I used earlier of the middle, while only 49% of similarly educated workers in other industries do so. Manufacturing is an area where the U.S. failed to play smart defense earlier in the 2000s. It is true that manufacturing has declined as a share of the workforce for the past 50 years, but that statistic is a bit misleading. This chart shows that the total number of manufacturing jobs in the U.S. economy fluctuated between 16 and 20 million between 1965 and 2000. So we had always stayed within this zone of 16 to 20 million manufacturing jobs. However, in the early 2000s, manufacturing employment began to drop precipitously. In the seven years before the Great Recession, the economy lost 3.4 million manufacturing jobs. And we lost another 2 million manufacturing jobs during the recession. Something different happened to American manufacturing in the early 2000s. Research by David Otter, David Dorn, and Gordon Hansen suggests that a sharp rise in imports from emerging markets, especially China, played an important role in the loss of manufacturing jobs in the early 2000s. Research by Nicholas Lardy and others suggests that the surge in Chinese manufacturing exports was driven by an increasingly distorted policy regime that artificially expanded higher value added manufacturing industries and as a consequence put American manufacturers at a disadvantage. While this surge benefited consumers who were able to buy cheap products, it came at the expense of millions of American middle class manufacturing workers. If these job losses were fully the result of competition on a level playing field, then it would not be appropriate to play defense. But this was not the case. In the last two years, the Obama administration has brought half a dozen cases against China in the WTO for unfair practices. And in February, President Obama launched an interagency trade enforcement center 
to protect American companies and workers from unfair competition. Recognizing the intense international competition that manufacturers face and the benefits of manufacturing for the rest of the economy and the fact that capital investment in manufacturing tends to be, tends to be more sensitive to international taxation, the President's corporate tax proposals would lower the tax rate for manufacturers to 25 percent and lower it further for advanced manufacturers. Unlike businesses in many non-traded sectors, manufacturers often compete with companies that locate in low-tax countries. The President has also called for a minimum tax on foreign earnings of American companies to prevent a global race to the bottom in terms of tax rates that would draw our manufacturers to shift production to tax havens abroad. My White House colleague Gene Sperling recently said that manufacturing punch punches above its economic weight. Economists are increasingly finding that the multiplier effect is larger in manufacturing than in other industries. The administration recognizes the importance of geographic concentration for manufacturing activity, especially for advanced manufacturing and other creative industries. Manufacturing often takes place in hubs. Recent research by Michael Greenstone, Rick Hornbeck, and Enrico Moretti find significant spillovers within local manufacturing clusters. Investment in one plant creates benefits for others in the area. These spillover benefits are greatest in areas where firms employ related production technologies and where workers move among firms. These mechanisms generate agglomeration externalities or beneficial spillovers to nearby companies. It is difficult for competitive markets to coordinate to provide the optimal number or scale of such agglomeration externalities. This requires smart offense. We have seen this model work before. AT&T used its monopoly power to fund Bell Labs. Bell Labs became the country and the world's idea factory. At its peak, Bell Labs employed 1,200 PhDs, and I should mention, uh, including my uncle, Robert Krauss, uh, who later uh, worked at Columbia University as a professor of psychology. Bell Labs' secret was to bring scientists from diverse specialties together with engineers and production managers to improve existing products and create new and better products. My Uncle Bob told me that the researchers at Bell Labs were given free reign to work on projects of their own choosing. And he also mentioned that they didn't need to raise any grant money. But he added that Bell Labs carefully selected the scientists that they hired and they chose scientists who were likely to contribute ideas in areas of interest to the operational units of Bell Labs, or of AT&T. And once someone developed an idea that was useful, there was pressure to apply it. The inventions that sprang from Bell Labs changed the world. These include the transistor, solar panels, the first communication satellite, cell phone technology, and lasers. There were also many, many other inventions that were less glabrous, but extremely important for telecommunications. The breakup of AT&T eventually led to the demise of Bell Labs. Although Bell Labs is gone, we can draw on the benefits of that model without having to rely on another monopoly. In his 2013 budget, President Obama proposed to build a national network of up to 15 institutes for manufacturing innovation. These institutes would serve as regional hubs for manufacturing excellence. The hubs would connect industry, government, colleges, and states to spur research and development. 
These centers could lead in the development of technologies such as lightweight materials for automobiles, aircrafts, ships, and trains, and play a key role in our nation's continued leadership and innovation. The President has already announced a competition for the first institute using existing funds. To further encourage R&D, the President has proposed enhancing the R&D tax credit and making it permanent. And new research by John Manrinan and Nick Bloom indicates that the R&D tax credit has uh, considerable external benefits for the U.S. economy. To support high-tech entrepreneurship, the President launched Startup America last year. This is a national campaign to improve the environment for high-growth entrepreneurs by expanding their access to capital and mentors. As part of Startup America, the administration has also taken steps to accelerate the commercialization of research and development. Recognizing the benefits of complementary investments in a given location, the Obama administration also expanded the New Markets Tax Credit. The New Markets Tax Credit will help to create jobs and attract investment in targeted areas. This tax credit uses federal funds in partnership with private or public investment to aid community revitalization. The administration has proposed in this year's budget to reauthorize and expand the New Markets Tax Credit and increase its allocation to $5 billion. The President's budget also proposed a new Manufacturing Communities Tax Credit that would provide $2 billion in credits directly targeted to investments in communities that have suffered a major loss of jobs because of a manufacturing plant closing or because of military downsizing. This sort of public-private partnership using the New Markets Tax Credit would help to create more and better manufacturing hubs in underserved communities across the nation. This approach recognizes that it is a confluence of factors that enable businesses to thrive. I can illustrate this by telling a story about a trip I recently made to a manufacturing plant in North Carolina. I visited one of Parkdale Mills textile plants in Sanford, North Carolina. Textiles, as you know, is literally the world's oldest manufacturing industry. About half of the productivity growth during the Industrial Revolution was because of increased productivity in textiles. For decades, American textile companies have been under intense competition from lower-cost labor abroad. This factory was recently reopened. Parkdale Mills operates 30 plants in seven states in the U.S and does about two-thirds of its production in the U.S. The company's CEO, Anderson Warlick, told me that the company has survived by continually raising productivity. The plant floor is a buzzing matrix of computer-operated machines that take raw cotton bowls and convert them into enough cotton fabric to make one million t-shirts each week. Mr. Warlick told me that the factory spends more money on electricity than it does on labor. This is an example of how the President's commitment to develop safe domestic energy sources, including natural gas, dovetails with his manufacturing initiative. The U.S. has among the lowest electricity costs in the world, and the remarkable fall in natural gas prices resulting from new extraction techniques has put further downward pressure on electricity prices. When I spoke to Mr. Warlick last week, he told me that one of the biggest obstacles his company is now facing is finding enough workers in the U.S. with the right skills. The company often hires workers who are trained at local community colleges. He also told me something that a lot of CEOs have been telling us lately. 
that more and more manufacturing companies are considering shifting more of their production back to the U.S. This emerging phenomenon is known as reshoring. Before the President's State of the Union address, the White House organized a meeting with manufacturing companies and the President who are in the process of reshoring jobs. I was lucky enough to attend this meeting, and I have to say it was energizing to meet with these business people. Many said that the model of sending production offshore was reaching diminishing returns. Labor costs are growing quickly abroad, and productivity is higher in the U.S. This chart shows that unit labor costs of production have grown more quickly abroad and that they've fallen in the U.S. since 2002. None of the business people we met with complained about regulation or taxes. Instead, they said that better infrastructure and assistance with job training would help to accelerate reshoring. This brings me to the last item in the President's blueprint. Improving education and skills training is critical for building an economy that will last and critical for expanding the middle class. In an, in, in an increasingly high-tech, knowledge-based economy, we simply can't afford to fall behind other countries in education. Yet that is what has happened in the U.S. Throughout much of the last century, educational attainment rose rapidly in the U.S. We led the world in high school education and then in college education. The rate of college completion quadrupled for those born between 1915 and 1975. But since then, the rate of college completion for subsequent cohorts has, has virtually stagnated. As a result, the U.S. has about the best educated 60-year-olds in the world, but we are in the middle of the pack of OECD nations among 30-year-olds. That's what this chart shows. It's hard to read, but the top panel shows people from age 55 to 64, and you can see the U.S. in red is in the far right, the highest college completion rate, and the bottom shows people age 25 to 34, and the U.S. is in the middle middle of the pack. A related problem is that college completion has risen the least for those for whom it is most valuable. Those born into families at the lower end of the income distribution have had the least increase in college completion. You can see that in this graph. The, uh, the red line shows college completion for people born in the early 1960s, broken down by which quarter of the income distribution their parents were in. And the red line shows the same thing for people born uh, between 1979 and 1982. The rise in college completion across these generations had primarily been confined to children from families in the top half of the income distribution. The slowdown in educational attainment and widening disparities by family background are a major contributor to the middle class jobs deficit. More highly educated workers are paid more, and research finds that those from more disadvantaged backgrounds benefit the most from higher education. To provide greater access into middle class jobs, President Obama and Education Secretary Arne Duncan have pursued an agenda to improve the quality of public K-12 education and to increase access to post-secondary education, especially for those from lower income families. The President's innovative $4 billion Race to the Top program incentivizes states to pursue effective, rigorous education reforms. In order to address our country's stagnant college completion rates, President Obama has set a goal that by 2020, 
America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. To reach this ambitious goal, the administration has made landmark federal investments in higher education to make college more affordable. President Obama has raised the maximum Pell Grant award up to $5,600 uh, in the 2013 to 2014 uh, fiscal year. Uh, that's a $900 increase from where it was in 2008. It's also worth noting that the number of people using Pell Grants has increased by 50% uh, over this time frame, or it's projected to increase by 50% over this time frame. Higher education can't just be a luxury for a few. It is the clearest path to better jobs and a stronger middle class for the country. To give more students an opportunity to complete higher education, the President has expanded education tax credits, establishing the American Opportunity Tax Credit in 2009 to assist families with the cost of college by providing up to $10,000 for four years of college tuition. Over 9.4 million students and their families have benefited from the American Opportunities Tax Credit, and I hope that some of you in the audience have benefited uh, from this new tax credit. Millions of Americans, including the President and First Lady, relied on student loans to pay for college. This week, President Obama called on Congress to act to prevent interest rates on federal student loans from doubling on July 1st. You may not recall that five years ago, Congress cut the rates on student loans in half, but that law expires on July 1st. If Congress doesn't act, the average student with these loans will rack up an additional $1,000 in debt. The President visited three colleges over the last two days to get the message out that keeping college loans affordable is critical to give more people opportunity to make it to the middle class. I also want to mention that one of our nation's unsung economic strengths is our network of community colleges. The administration has promoted partnerships between community colleges and employers to promote the dual goal of academic skills and on-the-job preparedness for the next generation. The Trade Adjustment, Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Fund will invest in community college and industry partnerships. Half a billion dollars has already been devoted to developing these partnerships. And over the next three years, half a billion dollars will be spent every year to help develop pathways into high-wage, high-skilled fields like advanced manufacturing. I should mention that when I was an academic at Princeton, uh, I did a study at Mercer County Community College, where I visited a number of the uh, factories that they provide joint training programs with. And it was really quite striking how community colleges were focused on preparing workers for jobs, um, much more so uh, than I had seen uh, from my own employer at the time. To help employers like Parkdale Mills and those struggling to get into the middle class, the President has proposed a new Community College to Career Fund. This would be an $8 billion investment to partner community colleges and states with businesses to train workers in a range of high demand fields. The President has also made it a priority to help more Americans get back to work by connecting them with skills training. The Bridge to Work program, which the President proposed and Congress passed in February, will, will allow up to 10 states to use unemployment insurance funds to create subsidized employment and training opportunities for the unemployed. The UI reforms also require the long-term unemployed to participate in job search assistance. Let me conclude by emphasizing a point that President Obama has made. 
Prosperity in America has always come from a strong and growing middle class. Our economy is recovering, but it is not fully recovered from the worst recession since the Great Depression. President Obama has made clear that getting back to where we were is not enough. After decades of stress, a comprehensive strategy is necessary to reverse the middle class jobs deficit and provide more security for the middle class. In manufacturing, all of the elements of the President's blueprint for an economy built to last come together to support middle class jobs. Innovation, American energy, skills and education, investment in R&D, and entrepreneurship. The blueprint leverages synergies among all of these factors. The President's manufacturing agenda also reinforces his national export initiative. And despite weakness in several of our trading partners, the U.S. is indeed on track to double exports by the end of 2014. Even a casual look at the GDP identity suggests that increased exports will have to make a greater contribution to U.S. economic growth in the future. Manufacturing represents 60% of U.S. exports. Any effort to meaningfully expand exports in the near term must rely critically on manufacturing, simply because of the outsized role manufacturing has always played in exports. But manufacturing is only one component of a comprehensive strategy to reverse the middle class jobs deficit and rebalance the economy. The U.S. must also look to expand service jobs and increase service exports, where we have a trade surplus. Policies that will leverage synergies across companies and with lo within local areas, as well as improving education and training to the unemployed, can lead to more service jobs as well as more manufacturing jobs. I think one thing we should be able to agree on is that what we were doing previously that led to the Great Recession and the deep financial crisis in 2008 did not work, did not work to expand middle class jobs. Simply cutting taxes for the well-off or cutting regulations did not expand the middle class. Instead, it brought the economy to its knees. President Obama's approach is very different. As I've tried to explain, it's an approach that focuses on investments in the kinds of things that have built the middle class in the past. And hopefully I left a little bit of time uh, over to take some questions, but Jan, you should tell me. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much for a very insightful and uh, innovative set of thoughts. We do have a few minutes for questions uh, from the floor. Please come to the microphone, identify yourself briefly, and keep the questions short so that we can allow more than one question. Paolo Mastrolilli of the Italian newspaper La Stampa. The panel that will follow your speech deals with the risk that uh, Europe will uh, derail the, the global uh, economy. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, comment, if possible, on that, and particularly if the countries that are in more difficulties in Europe, like uh, Italy and Spain, are doing the uh, correct things in order to avoid these uh, uh, problems. Uh Europe is uh, clearly going through a difficult time. Uh, I think uh, one lesson we can take away is that the difficult adjustments that the U.S. made uh, to strengthen our financial sector, as painful as that was and as unpopular as it was at the time, have put us in a very different position uh, compared to Europe right now. Uh, and Europe still has a, a lot of uh, adjustment to do to strengthen their financial sector. The, uh, U.S. is obviously connected uh, to Europe through both 
uh, trade and goods and services, as well as through uh, the financial sector. Uh, uh, Europe, European growth has, has slowed, uh, turned negative in uh, uh, many countries. Uh, U.S. exports to Europe have actually held up reasonably well. Uh, exports uh, bounce around from month to month, but uh, even though European imports have fallen considerably uh, since the start of their sovereign debt and banking uh, uh, problems, uh, their imports from countries outside of the U.S. fell a lot more than their imports from the U.S. So one of the reasons why uh, so far uh, we've remained on track for doubling exports is because our exports have held up uh, reasonably well uh, to Europe. Uh, it's important that the European policymakers address their problems. Our position continues to be that they have the resources and, and the capacity uh, to address their problems. Um, and uh, they've, made, uh, they've made much progress. Uh, and it's important that they, that they continue because a uh, tremendous amount uh, is riding uh, on them resolving, uh, on, on resolving their financial difficulties. My name is Justin Lovis. I'm with the Norwegian Business Daily. Um, what about the, all those that have fell, fallen out of the workforce already? Uh, what about the dangers of uh, hysteresis or, or like that they permanently lose out? And uh, what do you think about Mitt Romney's claim that the president has done far too little and that, well, the numbers that he are using for, for uh, describing the job losses and, uh, among women and among the middle class? You know, if you look at uh, where we were when the president came to office and the problems that were sitting on his desk, um, uh, and where we are now, uh, I think it's quite clear we've made considerable progress. There's certainly a long way to go, but we're on a much better path uh, than we were uh, on in 2008, before the president came to office. Uh, the uh, economy has added jobs for 25 months in a row. Uh, we know that recovering from a financial crisis uh, tends to be slow compared to other causes of, of recessions. If we compare the progress in the U.S. to other countries that have gone through severe recessions caused by financial crises uh, or other countries uh, today, I think our record looks uh, quite good. Uh, in spite of the deep hole that remains because of the middle class jobs deficit that had been building. Uh, for some time before the president came to office. Um, the uh, gender differences, I think a lot have been written about. The recession was particularly uh, severe in manufacturing, as I, as I noted, and in construction, uh, which tend to employ more men. So I think what we're seeing is kind of normal cyclical uh, type of pattern. Um, and uh, the most important thing going forward is to continue the progress that we've seen. Uh, we want to stay on the path of the recovery in the early 1990s and not look like the weak recovery uh, in the 2001 to 2007 period. Uh, and if you look at the progress in private sector job growth to date, we're very much uh, on the path from the early 1990s, uh, which is rather remarkable given all of the headwinds that this recovery has faced. Uh, so I think that's what's key going forward. Uh, in terms of labor force participation, labor force participation had been falling before the recession. That's partly a result of demographics, and it was also probably a result of the middle class jobs deficit, probably also partly a result that the economy was not producing enough jobs. Uh, so I think going forward, the, the, the key is to reverse the middle class jobs deficit, which is why I made that the title of my speech. Thank you. One more question. Harriet Jackson. It's exemplary what the U.S. government is doing under Obama to create new jobs in entrepreneurship. And you're right, it's something that we can be proud of as a nation. Um, what are we doing to, um, basically I see that the, the repayment of student loans, because they're so high, is now serving as a wall, a barrier to joining the middle class. So what are the plans of President Obama on that score? Well, first, uh, as I mentioned, um, it's important that Congress act uh, so uh, interest on student loans don't double starting July 1st. 
Uh, secondly, the administration has also put in place a program of income contingent repayments so that students who have not missed payments in the past uh, can repay as a share of their income. Uh, and I think that's limited to 10% of their income. Um, and then I would also mention the administration has been looking for ways uh, to slow the growth of college costs. Uh, the federal government provides a lot of support for universities, for colleges, for community colleges, um, and it's important that they recognize their mission uh, in response to these funds is to provide access to a wide range of students, um, and it's important for state governments to do their part as well. Uh, one of the things we don't want to see is states just offset the increase from the American Opportunities Tax Credit, for example. Uh, so that's something that, that we've been monitoring. Uh, we've been working on coming up with metrics uh, on, uh, on, on college affordability, uh, doing it at the institution, institution level so that families can have more information uh, about um, uh, what, what costs are. Um, and uh, the president has made as a very high priority increasing access to higher education. You can see from the figures that I've shown, the U.S. has slipped in our leadership in post-secondary education. Uh, that's a big part of the reason for the polarization in our economy. Uh, and uh, the fact that this has gone on for a while makes overcoming the problem even harder because children who are born uh, to less fortunate families uh, have had less access to higher education. We see that very clearly in the data. Thank you. I have the last question. Hi, I'm Ramon Pepinito. I'm a graduate student of economics at the New School. And you brought up two things earlier that I thought were, one was very important, talked about aggregate demand. And you also briefly mentioned uh, the mortgage issues, the mortgage crisis. And you've got millions of families in this country who are underwater in their mortgages, who are paying much more than what the house is worth. As you know, the more and more money they're, do, they're using to pay down these mortgages that are, unbur that are burdensome, uh, the less money they have for goods and services in the real economy. And you know, that's a, that's a massive drain on aggregate demand. What will you do to help shore up these families who are struggling with their mortgages, given the fact that previous efforts, such as HAMP, have been ineffective? Thank you. Uh, it, it, I, I, I think if you want to kind of take a step back and look at the economy and say, where did things go off the rails? The bubble in residential real estate, the excess construction that took place in the 2000s, uh, then the bubble burst, uh, which left a lot of uh, families uh, underwater, as you said, they owe more on their mortgage than their home is worth. Uh, their, their wealth was uh, greatly reduced because of the drop in uh, home values. Uh, often. Uh, they weren't fully informed of the terms of their mortgages, which uh, makes the problem even worse. Um, and the legacy of those problems, which built up uh, uh, for, 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 for a decade and really came to a boil in 2007, 2008, uh, are still uh, impairing uh, the recovery. Uh, we've done a lot of adjustment, uh, and it's been very painful, um, but stabilizing the housing market uh, is extremely important for the recovery. And if you compare this recovery to past ones, what looks quite different is residential construction, residential investment. Ordinarily, home building leads recoveries. That hasn't been the case uh, in this recovery. A and given that, the fact that the economy has been growing at the rate it has, the fact that we've had 4.1 million jobs added in the private sector is quite an achievement because one of the engines that usually powers a recovery uh, has not has not been working uh, from the very beginning and when I joined the administration in February 2009 uh, the administration has worked to try to help families modify their mortgages and uh, this is an area which is extremely difficult because of the comp complexity of the way uh, mortgages are, are written and who holds them and second liens uh, but it's an area uh, in spite of the difficulties I think uh, worth putting in a lot of effort uh, and close to a million uh, uh, homeowners have ha modified their mortgage under the HAMP program. Uh, millions of others uh, have modified their mortgages uh, under programs that were inspired by HAMP that banks private, privately implemented. Uh, the president uh, said in his State of the Union address in January uh, that he would like to see more support to write down principal and uh, has increased the incentives under the HAMP program 
for banks to write down principal, and we're seeing that uh, having an effect. Um, and he'd also like to expand to a wider set of uh, w wider set of borrowers. One of the problems here is some of the programs are restricted to those whose mortgages were insured by the GSEs, which is something that the homeowner typically wouldn't even know, uh, didn't have, uh, have much to do with. Um, so it's an area where there's a tremendous amount of arbitrariness because of the legacy of the way uh, the, the, uh, this sector of the economy has been allowed, uh, allowed to evolve. Um, but we are seeing some signs that the housing market is stabilizing. In some sections of the country, I think you're going to see uh, much stronger uh, uh, residential housing, uh, residential construction than in others. Some, some are going to take a longer time period given that there was much more excess construction in those areas. Um, but uh, looking down the road, I think that's a sector of the economy that's going to continue to heal uh, and that we will eventually get to the point where residential construction is supporting the recovery uh, rather than uh, being a headwind for the recovery. Well, thank you very much. Please join me to thank Alan once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's now take just a brief 10-minute break, and uh, we'll reassemble to have the second part of the program with the distinguished panel. Thank you.